You see all this water? Now you don't. Gone after two years of drought in Texas. We are driving on what used to be the bottom of the Falcon Reservoir, a large part of the reservoir. You can see by the water marks on these bridge pillars that the reservoir level in this area was 17 feet, more than five meters deep. We are here. We are in the lower Rio Grande Valley. Dr. Juan Enciso, an irrigation engineer and scholar at Texas A&M University, says severe drought in the region means less water from the Rio Grande collected and stored in the Falcon Reservoir. That coupled with a killer freeze earlier in the year led to crops dying on both sides of the U.S.-Mexico border. Like the citrus crop in Texas, resulting in a half a billion dollars loss in 2021 for the state's economy. And in Mexico, shortages of sorghum, essential for feeding the country's cattle. All because of water vanishing, drying up in reservoirs like the Falcon Reservoir. Yes, it's a very important water supply for both Mexico and the United States. There is some water left in the Falcon Reservoir, but almost 70% of its original capacity has dried up. 70% of its water gone. The drought is very serious because we don't have enough water to irrigate the crops. And we are in a very critical situation right now because it hasn't rained enough and we don't have enough water. Water has drained out of reservoirs across the western United States. Nearly half the country is now impacted by severe drought, according to U.S. government data, resulting in a staggering loss of crops and ag business. How big a loss? Almost $35 billion worth of crops lost to drought. Dr. Enciso says climate change has completely changed the rainy season, or rain patterns, in this region. Instead of rain coming steady over three months in the spring, it often comes all at once in a 24-hour period. For example, we film a tropical storm blowing in on this night in May of 2021, dumping four inches of rain, 10 centimeters, in just a few hours. By morning, the crops at Dr. Enciso's research farm at Texas A&M are flooded, drowning in rainwater, he says. That leads to crops rotting and dying from disease. Sometimes we have uh, disease problems because too much water, and also if we can spoil the the product. You, you filmed the storm yesterday. It rained a lot. It rained four inches. Generally, we don't have those kind of rains over here. Some may think that big rain overnight helped replenish the Falcon Reservoir, but only by a few inches. Nothing to mitigate the massive amount of water reserves lost from years of drought. To understand just how important water reservoirs like this are to farmers, we spoke with Dr. Alex Rosellas, an agroecologist at the University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley. Dr. Rosellas says reservoirs like the Falcon Reservoir are like savings accounts or slush funds that farmers rely heavily on during periods of drought. Think of it like any kind of slush fund, right? I mean, you, you keep, uh, you know, $100 uh, in your closet just for an emergency days, and every once in a while you take off a few bucks here and there, here and there, and then all of a sudden you're down to 10, 10 bucks, and you realize, oh my gosh, we need more. So once it reaches a certain point, we are in extreme drought, and often at that time, um, some of the users will implement drought-saving strategies. Drought-saving strategies that must be taken by farmers, he says, that include drastically reducing the number of times they water or irrigate their crops before harvest each year, thus lessening overall water consumption from the reservoirs, so that ultimately these water reserves last longer and can be shared by more farmers in the region. Farmers who've given up relying on consistent and frequent levels of rainfall. They become increasingly harder to predict, right? And so the strategy then is to, to try and to prepare for the unpredictable, right? And, and try to reduce the dependency on an, another external force 
to bring you what you need and just try to prepare and increase uh, your self-reliance on your own property. Dr. Enciso, as an irrigation engineer, says he began learning about how to conserve water 30 years ago as a young man growing up on a farm in Mexico, long before drought caused water shortages. My, my father was an agricultural engineer in Michoacan, and they talk about irrigation and, and, and researching water, how to conserve water. And, and, and it was very interesting to me, and I really wanted, I said, that's what I want to do. I want to design irrigation pumps, uh, to irrigate the crops, I want to see how can I use less water for the crops, and it, uh, it was fascinating to me. The main crop was avocados, so a lot of people were growing avocados and they wanted to produce more. They needed to produce more avocados back then in the 1980s, he says, because that's when guacamole in the United States and around the world became wildly popular. So avocado production in Mexico increased dramatically, which led to overwatering and over-irrigation, leading to the depletion of both groundwater and aquifers and water reserves in irrigation ponds, gravely dehydrating the local water supply. So they were irrigating, and by doing that, they were, they were affecting the hydrology of that area. They were depleting the aquifers, uh, by using more water, they were drying some rivers. So I, I thought that that was very important to study how to use less water, how to manage our irrigation more efficiently. Fast forward 30 years and Dr. Enciso's research today focuses on reducing the number of times crops need to be watered and determining whether crops can still be successfully grown with less watering sessions or fewer irrigations. Most of the crops they need, uh, like citrus, they require eight to 10 irrigations. Uh, vegetables, they re require four, five irrigations. So we have to reduce the number of irrigations. Dr. Enciso discovered many crops, like corn, for example, can be grown successfully with less water without impacting the overall yields for market. For example, uh, we can uh, irrigate in critical stages of the crop so we don't affect our yields that much. For example, if, if we have corn, the critical periods of corn are the flowering and the grain filling stage. So we can target those stages and we, we reduce the number of irrigations so we don't irrigate four or five times, so we irrigate two or three times in those critical periods of the crop. Indeed, Dr. Enciso confirmed crops can grow with fewer irrigations. He's also worked with farmers south of the border in Mexico to upgrade their irrigation systems, from replacing old leaky pipes to improving water canals or replacing the canals altogether. Measures taken that he says can help save hundreds of millions of gallons of irrigation water in Mexico annually. We have to uh, change canals for underground pipes. They use Poly pipe is a plastic flexible pipe. They irrigate the crops. So I, I think they have been a lot of progress. Farmers are being more efficient, but we have to be even more efficient every year. Back on the U.S. side of the border, Dr. Rosella says consumers of produce can help farmers conserve water by paying local farmers a bit more for their produce to help them cover the costs of upgrading more efficient irrigation systems in their fields. Dr. Rosellis tells farmers in the region that if both farmers and consumers are invested in conserving water during times of drought, everyone benefits. He calls it civic agriculture. Because you have a bunch of farmers who are practicing some of the best, most sustainable practices out there, and if you knew that, you know, if you were able to meet your farmer and being able to see the farm, I think you'd be more inclined to support them and pay the prices that that are worth paying, right? It's a it's something that they, they, they call civic agriculture, right? So it really allows farmers to grow food and sell them to local people. And and how to promote the civic ag. That's that's the challenge. As scarce as rain is these days, says Dr. Enciso, is government funding to make water irrigation systems more efficient in seventeen western US states. 
For example, in the massive $1.2 trillion budget recently passed by the U.S. government to upgrade the country's infrastructure, like roads and bridges, only a very small fraction of that, just $3.2 billion, goes for water projects, like repairing dams and streamlining irrigation systems. And far less government funding goes toward drought mitigation research that scholars like Dr. Rosellis and Dr. Enciso say is paramount for mitigating the impact of drought in the future. For example, Dr. Enciso recently completed groundbreaking research on growing more lint cotton, used for clothing, with less water. We were producing 35 pounds of lint cotton per inch of water. And with our research results, we were able to go to 60 and 75 pounds of lean cotton. So I think research is, is a good investment. And it helps to conserve water. So yes, there's some funding. We need more. How much research funding does an agriculture scholar like Juan and CISO need annually to help mitigate drought? I need about 250,000 per year. With that, I pay uh, two technicians. Uh, one helped me uh, with uh, doing experiments. The other one flying some uh, drones. I need also money to uh, travel. When I visit a farmer that he wants me to help him, to give some advice, I, I need to go and see his farm. So I need that money to go and visit farms, to buy equipment. Uh, so yes, they, I have received several grants from the federal government and from the state government, but I, I think it has to be more permanent and they have to be more uh, every year, not just once in a while. I want to show you my collection of masks. His collection of masks, he says, represents some of the countries he's traveled to to collaborate on research to mitigate the impact of drought. I have masks from different places. Uh, like this is from Mexico City. I, I have some from Guerrero. Uh, this mask is from China. Uh, this is from Michoacan. This is these masks are from the Caribbean, and, and this one is from Disneyland. <laughs> I'm singing in the rain, just singing in the rain. Come on with the rain, I will smile on my face. The days of taking rain for granted, he says, ceased being the norm long ago. Once full reservoirs, now literally clouds of dust, like distant memories. Rains replaced today, he says, by alarmingly hot and arid winds of climate change and drought, and vanishing reservoirs of water around the world.